Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. This is Season 7's Episode 11 of the Thoth Hermes Podcast, and it is November the 7th, 2021. My name is Rudolf. I am, as always, your host here on the Thoth Hermes Podcast, and it is my pleasure to welcome you back also this week for a new episode. And our guest here today will be Australian astrologer Shu Yap. I hope that you had a pleasant week. Uh, many of you really enjoyed last week's episode and I hope it will be just the same um, also for this week. Shu Yap is a very fascinating personality that uh, I discovered by the help of one of our most fervent listeners here. She knows when she listens that I mean her. And um, I was very grateful. It's And to be honest, it's always very nice when I hear from you, um, from people that you found and that might be interesting for this podcast. It has happened several times that I interviewed guys and girls who really um, I discovered through your help. So together with your music suggestions, the music that you, of course, have recorded and have also written, um, this is a very exciting addition to all that I can present here. And, um, well, if sometimes I cannot follow all your tips and tracks, um, don't be mad at me, but uh, it's just too much. Um, it's great that you do that. And once again, this time... Shuyap is a discovery that I made thanks to one of you. And um, I'm really grateful because she was lovely to talk to and also very, very interesting uh, as a person. Right. So the South Hermes podcast, you know it by now, I hope. If not, um, go to our website, www.sourcehermes.com. That's T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com and find out all about us and also all about the previous 101 episodes no 102 sorry episodes already so and um, you can there also find uh, all the show notes and all the links to the respective people and their work and their books etc etc plenty plenty of stuff to discover also Leave me some feedback there. We have a contact form there. You have the email address info at thoughthermes.com there. And you have even a voicemail. Haven't been using voicemail lately lots. So, guys, let me hear your voice. Send me a voicemail from the website. It's always lovely to hear from you. Right. And while you're there, you know what's coming. Patreon. Yes, guys, I need you. I need your help. I need your support. Uh, every week it costs some money and I'm happy that we have some supporters who really help me carrying that along. Thank you all. And uh, well, it would be nice if some more of you did that. Um, we got more and more weekly listeners. I'm very happy and very proud of that. So it'd be nice also if the number of Patreons increased a little bit. Go to patreon.com and look for the Sauce Hermes podcast. TH podcast is the short for it. And um, if that's too hard to find, also go to the website. And there is the Patreon button there. Not to worry. Even on the YouTube channel, in under each episode you find the first line where it says support this podcast and you have a link to Patreon there. So no excuse. Thank you. And um, well, those of you who are regulars and more and more of you are, they know what's coming now. Music, of course. And once again, it's music from one of our listeners. He's called Pete. Pete of the Beat is his pseudonym. Uh, I believe he's called Pete, but um, he goes by Pete on the beat. And 
he is a musician and his music and the music that tracks that he sent me he tries to incorporate the art of turntablism with heavy uh, 808 synth melodies and chord progressions and uh, well he hopes that we like them and i'm sure you like them uh, it's a very very vivid very nice type of music but of course it's not just like that music um, in the way he describes it it's all linked to his personal occult path and also the 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 titles of course of the tracks that we have here today they reflect that so it's it's really influenced by his occult work pete has also not only not only written music but also written a book about Omad gains. I didn't know what Omad means actually, but maybe that's because I'm European. So I looked it up. It's one meal a day. One meal a day gains practical self help and natural bodybuilding. So interesting. Maybe I should have a look into that. Would certainly make me look a bit, a bit, um, well, slimmer. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Okay. But enough blur. Now let's listen to his first track of music and. Well, the title of the track uh, that Pete on the Beat created here, well, it has to be the first one here on the Thought Hermes podcast. It's called As Above, So Below. Not much more to say, so Pete on the Beat and his track As Above, So Below. Enjoy.
As Above, So Below by Pete on the Beat, one of our listeners and fans of this show who provided us with the music for today. More of that, of course, in the break of the upcoming interview. And in that interview, we're going to meet Shu Yap. Shu Yap, who is a professional and traditional astrologer with nearly 20 years of study. And if you haven't heard much about her yet, it's maybe for two reasons. A, she, well, three reasons, actually. She is A, and that's probably the main reason and also the reason for the second reason I give you. She's a very modest lady and I think she knows much, much more than she would admit to know. And he, she is really, she's really quite a fascinating personality, I must say. And you'll hear that all through the interview. She has lots of things to say. Very, very interesting. And well, the second reason comes from that. She has not published a book so far. Well, if you guys from the different edi editors and publishing houses out there listen to me, give me a shot and I will put you in touch with Shu. She didn't ask me for that, but I think you really should get in touch with her and she should write a few of her things down. Would be really worth it. And well, the third reason might also be that she lives um, near Melbourne, Australia in quite a remote place. So she is a Maybe not a hermit, that might be exactly exaggerated, but she is um, a bit off the main tracks and so it's a bit harder to find her. She does more than reading charts for clients. She embodies astrological lore in her own everyday life. She is a grower and a beekeeper, but also a mother and an art hobbyist. Um, her paintings are really lovely. So, and um, she tries to bring astrology to the world. As always, I'm trying to read a text to you of the person that I interview. And uh, as she has not written a book, I, I thought I would read one of her blog entries on her website, intercycle.com. You'll find the link to her website, of course, in the show notes. And um, this is a blog, uh, blog entry from December 2020. Uh, many people at the time were talking about the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction that was going on around those months. And um, well, she commented on that with a blog entry called Is This the Dawn of the Age of Aquarius? And here is what Shu Yap has to say. Many people are confusing the first Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in the air sign of Aquarius with the concept of the Age of Aquarius. However, these two concepts are not related at all. The idea of the age of Aquarius is somewhat a modern construct created to bring meaning to the precession of the equinoxes. The definition provided by Merriam-Webster Dictionary describes the precession of the equinoxes as a slow westward motion of the equinoxes along the ecliptic caused by the gravitational action of sun and moon upon the protuberant matter about the Earth's equator. The fact that a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in the air element happens to occur in the sign of Aquarius has many com people confusing it with the age of Aquarius. Rather, the Saturn-Jupiter cycle is an ancient system of societal timekeeping used by ancient cultures as far back as the Zoroastrians. Some hypothesis that the Jupiter Saturn conjunction could have been the star of Bethlehem that led the three wise men to find Jesus. The Age of Aquarius is a much newer concept that has been constructed independently by the modern astrology movement. In more modern times, though, astrologers look to the cycle of Saturn and Jupiter to predict world matters. Topics like financial markets, political systems, leaders, regimes, weather, stock markets, social trends and other matters falling into the branch of astrology called mundane astrology. Their systematic 20-year cycle and 200-year elemental sign shift makes the Saturn-Jupiter cycle a cosmic clock of world affairs. Therefore, the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in Aquarius is not related to the age of Aquarius at all. Personally, as a student of traditional astrology, I will always work with the Saturn-Jupiter cycles for understanding world patterns in mundane astrology or topics involving life structure, goals and aspirations in personal natal astrology. 
so far that interesting blog reading from Shuyab's blog. And now we are going to meet herself, Shuyab. Let's move down to Australia and meet her at her home near Melbourne. Here comes the interview. Today on the Thoth Harmony podcast, I have the pleasure to go. Well, we Eurocentric people always say we go down under, but of course, that's an insult because you're not down there. You're just on the other side. And um, I'm going to Australia once again to the area of Melbourne, I believe, in the state of Victoria, in any case. And we're going to meet a very interesting woman astrologer, um, Shu Yap, who, um, by the way, I was pointed towards her and got interested in her through some listener comment that you gave me, you listeners. So thank you for that. Do that more often because it's, as you see today, it's always very useful. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Shu here on the Thought Hermit podcast. Good evening. It's late evening in Australia. It's midday here, but it's very nice to have you. Good evening, Shu. A very good evening to you and your listeners, Rudolph. And it's such an honor to be here as a listener of your show as well. So I'm very, very, yeah, honored to be here. And I'm surprised that I've even been asked to be on here. So yeah. no, that that's very nice. And um, you see, it's, a, it's all a family kind of, you see. And that's nice. And it's always very really good to discover people we would otherwise not uh, altogether not discover if not somebody pointed us towards them. Um, Shu, you uh, live in Australia, as I just said, and uh, you practice astrology, but you are not originally, as your name might, name might also tell us, you're not originally from uh, Australia. You moved there. You're going to tell us more about that because, of course, as those regulars here know, I always try to ask my guests how they became within the world of the esoteric and the occult, what they are today. And that's why also my question and my first question that goes to you is, um, where did it all start? How did you initially become interested in astrology and how did you develop then your particularities in that field? Mm, yes, great. Yes, I'm. I am from. Um, Melbourne is the closest city to me. However, I live two hours from there. I live on a farm in central Victoria. So, as, as well as being an astrologer, I am a grower and a beekeeper, and I definitely integrate everything that I do in the astrology sort of sides in terms of you know, growing my things, making medicines, and this is where the spagyrics comes in as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. a bit eclectic here. But um, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm not born in Australia. I was born in Malaysia. And um, t when I was, uh, I guess, seven years old, I moved over to Australia. Um, and that was, I guess, as a result of my father passing away uh, when I was four years old. Um, and that kind of started a whole new uh, life for me here in Australia. Um, but in terms of getting into esoteric, the esoteric world, I guess there's two kind of parts to it. There's the, uh, you know, seemingly the conscious side of this and very much an unconscious side that I've started to become very aware of now in my later years. Um, you know, the story goes that, you know, I woke up one day when I was 19 years old and just thought, oh, I've got to study astrology. And I just literally, oh, really? <laughs> went, yeah, I just literally woke up like this. And, I, and I've always been very um, st strong in my dream world. And my family have, from my father's side, you know, they, uh, they treat the dream world as if it's the same as you know, the real world, so to speak. Um, I've often had experiences of um, family members, you know, tell me things I can or can't do or things I need to need to do because of a dream that they've had. So I kind of grew up in that um, uh, environment for my dad's side of the family anyway. My, my mother's side of the family are much different. Um, but when my father passed away when I was four years old, um, 
obviously that was a huge disruption to the family. Sure. But it really left behind something in me that I was later to discover was very significant. So my father was a very devout Taoist and he was part of a sect in um, Malaysia where I guess it was more the esoteric Taoist side. You know, they were into Mm -hmm. more the sorcery aspects of Taoism. I remember um, going to the temples with him and, um, you know, for three days a week, the Taoist priests would sit would go into trance and the people of the community were able to get a a ticket to be able to see him for all sorts of issues, like if they were sick or if they had problems and the Taoist priest would either make a talisman or counsel them through a trance, like, you know, through invoking the the deity of the temple. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a child, I never went to doctors or anything like that. We mm-hmm. always went to this Taoist priest if we were sick to get a talisman. <laughs> so that was the world that I kind of grew up in, much to my mother's despise, who was a converted <laughs> Christian. <laughs> okay, so the- yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so was this more a, a, rural, a rural area or more an urban area that you grew up in? Yeah, so my, this was a rural sort of area mm-hmm. uh, where this all this stuff went down. My mother was kind of... You know, in those days, you know, the women kind of just followed wherever the the husbands went to, I guess. So she kind of was pulled out of her, the safety mm-hmm. of her community and was living in the middle of, you know, another community with all this, you know, black magic stuff happening. So, yeah, she was probably still very traumatised. <laughs> so needless to say, when my father passed away, I never got any, uh, there was really no connection to that world anymore and all the connection that I had was really through my own spiritual connection which is all very unconscious at this stage but I I do remember just yeah always having this sense of trust that something has always got my back and I've always felt that and I always put that down to you know my father being in spirit Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time when I was 19 which is a very significant astrological year result of the nodal return um, I also got pulled into spiritualism and I sat in a mediumship circle for 10 years um, and became very accustomed to my father through Mm -hmm. the circles there Um, so and I was studying astrology concurrently at the same time and interestingly I remember at one time I had a reading from from another medium and they said I've got your father with me and he has something to give to you and I don't know what it is but it looks like a gold circular thing with all these inscriptions and at the time I didn't understand anything of that. I said, I'll leave it with me. I'll, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. But at my next nodal return, which was not that long ago when I was 38, uh, yeah, I became very active in making talismans. And Mm -hmm. I also had the opportunity just before COVID hit to go back to visit the temple, which I have very faint memories of, but to be able to have a sitting with the priest and have him invoke my father and having a conversation with him. And the priest was saying that, oh, we just by looking at me, he knew I was his daughter because I guess of my appearance. And he immediately pointed to the temple's altar and said, that's your father's stuff there. When he died, all of his altar things came to the temple's big altar. Oh, right. So that was a Taoist temple again, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it was the yeah. same temple, the, the same. exact okay. one that, mm-hmm. yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, that okay. I used to get talismans from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it all came back to me that this second nodal return, that, um, that that thing that was given, that my father was showing me when I was 19 was in fact most likely a, a gold talisman. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting because I have... Um, I did a big solar ritual um, one year uh, where I did make a solar talisman and I really did feel him uh, 
right next to me. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was, I just knew what to do. And uh, when I saw, when I was in the temple and I saw the priest and the priest's assistant sort of getting all the materia ready for the session, I looked at that and I thought, wow, that looked like me when I was doing the solar uh, talisman, so the, the solar ceremony. So it was a bit of a mirror kind of image of like um, eternal time, like stepping into fragments of eternal time, but at very different chronological times. Mm-hmm. Um and in fact, his altar items that were up there in the temple that the priest was showing me was a picture of um, a, a serpent, which was one of the temple's um, key sort of um, symbols. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then his statue of the deity of the temple. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, this is exactly my chart because the, the serpent is uh part of the symbolism of Rahu and Ketu in the Mm -hmm. astrological chart, the North Node and South Node is symbolised by this serpent, the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. Sure. And that was next to his deity statue, which to me represented him. And in my chart, I've got the South Node with the sun, which represents my father Mm -hmm. in the 12th house, the place of temples. So I kind Mm -hmm. of looked at that as a very physical manifestation of my chart and seeing, yeah, it was just a really trippy moment where I I saw all of these fragments of my life come together. And that is what a nodal return can feel like. So (laughs) very hard to put into words. Yeah. It's kind of like describing a dream. uh, Absolutely. I mean, we are here, as we said initially, we are here among people who listeners are mostly very much educated in the field, but maybe not in particular in astrology. We try to collect many, many facets of the esoteric world, but the, the general feeling probably is, is very related all together. And I think I think our people understand very well what you mean by, by what you're saying. Yeah. You said it suddenly happened at 19, so at the first null return, that you said, I want to do astrology. but. Was this really your first contact or have you been in contact before the age of 19? Maybe not active personally, but um, mm. b- with people who who practiced astrology or mm. how, did it, yeah. how did it come into your life? Yes, well, very subconsciously as well. I know I, I own very few possessions of my father, but one of the maybe two things that I own of his and one of them is a copper tooling of a Kuan Yin piece of art that he made when he was sick in hospital. And the other thing was an astrology book, which Mm -hmm. I haven't really read. It's it's more like a pop culture sort of Chinese astrology book. It's always just been sitting on my shelf. um, And, you know, I wasn't really... um, I'm not into into Chinese. I, I don't know much about Chinese astrology, but it was just something that I came across on a visit back to Malaysia one year when I was much younger and I saw his name written in the book and I thought, I'm just mm-hmm. going to take this because <laughs> it was just, <laughs> just as in someone's house. Um, so I guess it's always been in the background. I, I, I guess I was into horoscopes and things like that, but nothing like what anyone else would not would be into, you know, it wasn't anything. It was definitely an interest, but it was just for some reason I woke up at 19 and I had to study it and I rung someone that I knew who was a tarot reader and I said, do you know any teachers? She pointed me to someone else and that someone else said, no, you don't need to have an astrology teacher, you just need to go to a the Theosophical Society bookshop and find yourself a book. <laughs> so look for Rob Hand, you know, so Robert. <laughs> so I, I went straight there, you know, to the city. I took a train into the city and I looked at Rob Hand's book and I thought, oh, my God, this just seems so complicated. I'm never going to be able to teach this to myself. And then I looked around on the edge of the, the bookshelf. There was a tiny little advertisement which was about 10 centimeters wide by five centimeters wide, like a business card and it just said astrology lessons weekly pay by the week which was you know I was only a student at the time so I could never afford to pay yeah, so I thought yeah. oh I can afford twenty dollars a week that's fine and it happened to be just around the corner to where I was living so all these things have 
almost just fallen into my lap that Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah so I guess yeah nothing in it consciously uh you know meant to be but it was all meant to be yeah yeah when you when you said that about you being a very young girl and your father died you were four i i remembered a story i had with one of my guests just recently bianca bondi who is that south african artist living in paris and she had a very similar experience with her occult uh, awakening so to speak where her father died at very young age and i sometimes ask myself now those two stories are very obvious in that sense but uh, i wonder how, what's your opinion on that i sometimes have the impression that that most young children under the age of seven or so are in general much more open to the let's call it the spirit world to to take a, 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 a straightforward name right and so are also much more um open to receive um those instructions and do you think the fact that it has happened very early in your age with your father's loss uh, that this has changed something for the remainder of your life in that respect or uh, or is that just a coincidence well i guess yes to a degree because i've never really questioned the fact that there was a spirit world I've always Mm -hmm. kind of felt that I have had a relationship with my father and that might seem ludicrous to people that maybe aren't in my situation, but yeah, it's never been something to question at all. But I guess Mm -hmm. that's also based on my father's side of the family that were, I guess, yeah, into the spooks, you know, so I was, I remember a time when I was about eight, 16 or 17, um, my friends and I had planned a camping trip away, like by ourselves, like no adults. And there were some older people there that were going to drive. And, you know, so it was really like I was really, really excited looking mm. forward to it. And my auntie, my my father's sister, happened to be in Australia at the time. And she said, I've just had this dream. You can't go to this camping trip. So, and you can imagine how devastated I would have been as a 16, 17 year old girl, you know, cause that was like something we've been looking forward to for ages. And, um, but yeah, I didn't go. And so that's how I guess strong and important these messages are, that, that how serious these messages are taken in my father's side of the family. Right. And, <laughs> and my and mum my mum just gets along goes along with it for fear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, did something happen then during that trip that that confirmed that she was right or, or did you just No. Forward? They no. they all came back safely okay. uh, but maybe if I had gone I might have jinxed it all. Yeah, but, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. As yeah. they say the magician is never late it's he who who, who directs time, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, yeah. so um, you you just talked about uh, uh, astrology and uh, your Chinese astrology background to your father, but your choice was completely different, right? So it's mm-hmm. um, based in today uh, uh, in traditional astrology, even maybe we could give a few definitions or you should give a few definitions um, just to make make it clear what traditional astrology actually means also in your own terminology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a bit eclectic in terms of that I, anything to me before the 17th century, I would class as, I guess, traditional or classical. But Mm -hmm. within that period, I have interest in um, various different forms of astrology, like um, Hellenistic, Babylonian and generally Arabic um, based astrology, um, the translations from the Arabic period, they're my mm-hmm. my key focus. A little bit of the Renaissance stuff for my horror work, but um, generally, yeah, generally Hellenistic and, you know, Arabic is the, the, the stuff that I'm really into that I geek out on. Okay. So we, we're coming yeah. back to that in a moment. But we, you said the... the t- the change it, it's no longer traditional astrology in its terminology after the 17th century so what what happened in that period that has changed mm-hmm. astrology 
Well, astrology was nearly lost completely, uh, you know, due to all sorts of stuff, religion, like, you know, Christianity, um, I guess also the, you know, the, the, the witch trials and all, the, all sorts of stuff like that, which, mm. you know, all of us probably have had a past life there. Um, and then when it had a little bit of a mini revival in the 18th hundreds, um, it kind of only was able to be recognised as any form of, I guess, serious study if it was lumped in with the area of psychology. And so it all became very individuated and psychological mm -hmm. in so far as that we really lost the, the essence of um, the, the wholeness, the integrated wholeness of what astrology was. To me, this was very much a, a, like, you know, in our chemical terms, a, a stage of separation. Mm -hmm. You know, we really were like pulling the human, the, the, the material completely out from the heavens and just seeing that as its sort of individual kind of um, unit. Oh, and so stepping back as well, I guess the Copernicus and his theories about, you know, <clears throat> the earth not being central, that the sun yeah. is now, um, yeah, that was a big blow to astrology. Um, but see, this is the, the the thing that I've, the essence that I've really come to understand and uh, and now try and convince people that, especially when you're reading traditional texts, the languaging can be, is not meant to be interpreted literally. Hmm. It's all very symbolic language. Uh, and if you try to interpret it literally, that's where all, all sorts of judgments and flaws can come out. And so this whole symbol of um, the earth being in the centre of the celestial sphere spheres uh is you know it, it is a model and a symbol it's not necessarily the literal which is yeah what you know this materialistic world you know is they find very hard to sort of step outside of that that framework of mind yeah which also explains uh, when then the uh, the knowledge of further planets beyond Saturn uh, was present in people's minds um, that they mm. had the impression they had to add those planets to general astrology and then Pluto was taken away again from them and and so this created a whole yeah. a whole buzz around that and and traditional astrology yes. doesn't, doesn't worry about those things right yes I mean I I look at the Uh, outer planets, so that's Neptune, mm -hmm. Uranus, Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, yeah. mm -hmm. as a secondary thing. I still look at them because I you still do. think mm -hmm. they are valid. But I do think that if you just looked at the seven planets, it would still tell you the exact same things, exactly what you needed to know. And these outer planets may just re reaffirm, uh, so, you know, the, the points that the seven traditional planets, you know, originally yes, have of stated course. through their symbology. And an so, astronomer might um, tell you that those two out of those seven planets aren't even planets, right? So, so Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. But but this figure seven probably is a very important one in regards to traditional astrology, not just not just the, the names you put on them, but the, the, the number seven is certainly also important, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that that is the um, connected to the Saturn cycle. Mm. So every seven years we get 90 degrees of the Saturn cycle occur and they then culminate at the return around 29, 30 years, you know, give or take, tw between 28 and 30 years. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they're often very significant times where we can map out huge foundational developments in our lives. Um, usually at the younger years, we may not see the developments within ourselves that much, but it may be projected onto the people around us or decisions that are being made that have somewhat have a big impact on on the, the seven-year-old child. Mm -hmm. um, we also see lots of developmental things happening from a physical, biological perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is significant. Um, yeah, but, you know, all numbers are significant, like depending on which cycles there's, there's sure. all these different cycles happening at, 
at the same time. Um, um, yeah, I don't know how much you want to go into the astrology yet, but, um, you know, one one big time is, is around the 41-year-old stage mm-hmm. where lots of cycles converge. <laughs> well, I, I, let, let's, before we go into those details, let's talk now about uh, your choice of Arabic Hellenistic um, path that you that you prefer in a way. So maybe you can give us uh, explanations for your choice and and what the particularity of those paths is that you have chosen. Mm-hmm. Well, Hellenistic because it is so foundational. Uh, you know, the Greeks really were the first ones to really. I guess intellectualize astrology mm. and um, merge that with the philosophy, uh, mainly of Plato and Socrates. And uh, so there's a lot of foundational techniques in the Hellenistic era that, uh, you know, is the core of my practice. Um, the Arabic stuff I really love in terms of their knowledge on the magical side of things. Mm. And um, they also were great with their work around um, Time Lord systems as well that I use, uh, mainly the Persian Fadaria systems, uh, as well as the works of um, Abu Mashar and his practices with annual perfections and solar revolutions. And then the Babylonian is like, I love the Babylonian um, style mainly because it's so observational. Mm. And I came into that, I guess, the most recently. Um, I guess living out on land, I have, you know, a, a natural sort of dark sky park available to me and every night I'm looking at the stars. Um, so that's kind of really given me a better understanding of my astrology knowledge because it's just so much more, I guess, enriching to be able to view it happening in real life than to see it on my computer screen. <laughs> well, I'm sure. So, actually. It's fascinating. Yes. And many people don't even see stars anymore because they live in cities where the nights are so bright that you don't see stars anymore. That's it's, it's Yeah, that's terrible. right. See, I, I live um, off grid, you know, I barely have any power mm-hmm. <laughs> myself for myself. <laughs> um, so, you know, we I'm lucky in that regard. But I guess the observational stuff as well brings in a very animistic uh, level of being Mm. experienced with the stars, as well as the idea of the pattern logic that exists in the whole environment. Um, The fact that we can dissect whether a planet is fast or slow, moving forwards, backwards, rising before the sun, after the sun, all these patterns have a logic to them. And they're all symbols to which we can draw upon uh, for our understanding of ourself or our situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've recently read an interesting sentence. It was more meant in in relation to ceremonial magic, but you mentioned symbols here and you did already a bit earlier. And that reminded me of that sentence where it said symbol is um, symbol is the language, is the words, is the language, right? And ritual mm. is the grammar to put the words together. Mm. Um, and I find that in regards to ceremonial magic, a very nice description. And when you say that, is there something like a grammar, so a ritual type of uh, thing in astrology that would put the symbolism together on a level to make it understandable? Yeah, in terms of a ritual. Uh, do you, So do you mean like in terms of is, are there ritual practices that are used with astrology? Um, I didn't mean it exactly like that, but of course, that's also an interesting question. Yeah, um, which yeah. relates more to other stuff that, that you also integrate in your, in your practice, as I hear from what you're saying, like alchemy and other things. But... Um, but I, I more mean the way you would maybe, for example, create a chart or the way you observe the stars. That's what reminded me now when you said that you were observing them yourself. Is there a kind of ritualized way of doing that that helps you understand the language that you receive, the symbols that you receive? 
Oh, right. Okay. So yeah, like say if I was about to go into a session with someone, mm. do I have some kind of thing to tune in? Well, right. I always put on my talismans that I, mm-hmm. that I've created for readings. Um, and no, well, you know, I do have a bit of a process where I do, I always do a meditation before mm. I see each client or do each, do any kind of teaching sort of presentation or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I know what you mean. And sometimes like, it's like I have two sets of eyes. Like I can sometimes look at a chart when I don't have my astrology eyes on and nothing makes sense to me. And I'm like, oh God, I can't believe I'm an astrologer. None of this makes sense. But I have to, obviously I have to be sit in silence. And that's why I work at nighttime when the kids are in bed and it's almost like a new lens comes on and things just mm-hmm. start kind of speaking to me in the chart. And I, I can't quite work out what what that is. Um, I guess it's the more you kind of get into that zone, that flow state, I guess. It's about mm-hmm. opening up and, uh, you know, being that vessel for these symbols to speak to you. But, of course, there are always times that once you, once you understand symbology and, well, the symbology of the stars, you know, in my in my instance, it, it's always screaming out at you. For example, um, I haven't because I live off the grid. I have a mm-hmm. shower outside. There's it's completely in the open air, and I at this t- one time last year, oh, Saturn and Jupiter, Jupiter were very close together last year because they came together in a conjunction. Mm-hmm. And every night I would have a shower and look up and see them coming closer and closer together. And I happened to one day have a shower during the daytime and I immediately looked up just by habit and I thought, oh, that's a shame. I can't see Saturn and Jupiter because it's the daytime. But as soon as I thought that, this eagle and this crow just fly above my, over my head. So the eagles, okay, um, yeah, Jupiter, yeah, and sure. the crow with Saturn. Saturn oh, we yeah. don't have crows. We've got ravens, but, the you know, ravens, blackbird. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, you know, the, it's, it's the animistic world. It's the symbology. You know, sure. to anyone that could have been just an eagle and a crow flying past. But because I recognised and registered it, I knew in my heart that that was Saturn and Jupiter saying, oh, we're still here. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, just, no, I, the timing's I, of off. Course. <laughs> yeah. but that's, that's how it all works. It happens with all kinds of practices that we do. I think when you recognise those symbols in a way that others who don't do that work will not recognise them as such, of course. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's the work of, like, acknowledging the the symbolic the synchronicity between the yes. two worlds exactly um which is you know so much of jung's work that he kind of went on about which was i was heavily influenced by when in my modern days of astrology mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but i i still i still very much value jung's work um, oh yeah but yeah, yeah oh. he's he's incredible yeah definitely yeah Well, for some reason before the interview, I did not announce that I'm going to break and play some music for you. But, well, of course, those of you who know the show, they were expecting that. So here we are. We will take a little break in that really interesting and lovely talk with Shu and listen to music again by Pete on the Beat. Pete on the Beat, I remind you, is the guy who offered us music for you today. He is a listener of the, a regular listener of the Thoughts Hermes podcast. He is a musician. He has written that book, Omad Gains, and he is having an own website where he produces book summaries, writes about various occult and personal development topics, and shares experiences uh, from his own life path. So um, s- go there if you have time. It's an interesting website, really. And what I also wanted to point out, um, if you have time, go and look uh, on his music videos. Now you're just listening, of course, because this is an audio podcast only. Um, But if you go to YouTube, to the Pete on the Beat channel, I will link that also in the the show notes. Um, Then you can not only listen to the music, but while you listen to the music, you see his video installations because he's also a video artist, Pete on the Beat. So our next um, track from him that we will 
here now is called self-sufficiency. And um, then we will return immediately to meet Shu and continue our talk with her. And immediately after the talk, track number three by Pete on the Beat. And this one is called Vitruvian Man 777. I guess all of you know what the Vitruvian Man is. Hmm? No, you don't? Okay, I'll tell you. You know uh, Leonardo da Vinci's guy in the middle of that pentagram, the man figure with the extended arms? And Yeah, yeah, you remember now? Okay, yes. That's called the Vitruvian Man. Okay, so Pete on the Beat with self-sufficiency. After that, second part of our interview with lovely Shu Yap. And after the interview, track number three by Pete, Vitruvian Man 777. Enjoy. Is. 
What I find very interesting when I hear you speak um, all the way through, right? And even we spoke a little bit about that before we started the interview. Um, you seem to link all kinds of practices into your work. So this is, I mean, if I, I hope I remember well now, but I don't remember we've had any astrologer here on this show yet, which actually oh. was high time wow. to do that after more than a hundred <laughs> shows. But maybe it's also because Well, not talking about myself here, but it's also because I'm I'm coming from from ceremonial magic and hermetism, and um, and uh, astrology is of course one of the basic teachings you have to know there. But it was always my weak point, like the piano when I do music, you know. So <laughs> maybe that's why I subconsciously didn't really didn't really pay enough interest in it. So it was about time, but. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go the other way around. You do, um, uh, you have for me a very holistic approach as opposed to other astrologers I know. Mm. And that's what also I found so interesting when I read about you. Um, you mentioned alchemy twice or three times already during our talk now. And in relation to that, also spagorism, right? Um, you mentioned spiritism in the very beginning. Um, in our talk before, we were talking briefly about hermeticism. Um, so can you tell us why you think you are doing that and um, mm. why it is also important to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I don't have ADHD, but, but um, <laughs> perhaps, you know, I think one thing that I, I think what you may be trying to get, get at is that I see astrology as a horizontal layer mm -hmm. that it is almost like a latent group of a latent symbolic language that needs to be applied and rooted in lots of vertical layers, if you know right. what I mean. So that's when astro I've always feel astrology is best when it's t combined with something else. Mm -hmm. So I like to combine my astrological work with my work in agriculture. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. you know I don't like to call myself a farmer because I think farmers sort of destroy land, whereas I'm more about regener like la you know, regenerating like right. compacted farmland. <laughs> okay. Um, so. So my work, even when I look at my bees, because I've, I've actually developed a strong uh, allergy to, to bee stings, I only oh, open okay. the bees up in the planetary hours of the sun and Venus, and that has really helped me okay. to not be hurt uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I, I just, so these are just examples of the fact that you have to kind of bring the stars down, like it, Otherwise, it just stays as a layer in the sky, mm -hmm. if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that kind of fits with that whole hermetic sort of axiom of as above, so below. Like it and sure. it has to come down, it has to go back up. It, it's it's a two-way sort of channel. Otherwise, it just stays as latent potential um, to me. Um, and so this is influences my work in making spagyric medicines and like growing and even the way I work with clients, you know, it's all about, yes, we can talk philosophical about the chart and, and look at the eternal, in, eternal time of the chart, but it's also about bringing it down to some material like guidance and advice, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it, it plays out on many different levels, but I mm -hmm. think that maybe is the A philosophy behind why I may seem eclectic, but really it, it's, to me, I don't see it as eclectic. It's more as like, that was the way it was meant to be. Uh, no, to me, it's the contrary. I, I don't think, uh, uh, to me, you don't seem eclectic at all. You're, as I said, my word is rather holistic because mm. um, it's integrating and eclecticism integrating. is, is I, I, I think I'm eclectic myself a lot, but that more pick out things uh, instead of seeing the whole sometimes. And, and, and I don't get that feeling at all. But it, 
give us a let's go a bit deeper into that because you for example you just mentioned the bee sting situation very interesting maybe <laughs> maybe you can develop that a little bit because i think that's practically interesting for some people out there but mm. also when you talk about spagyric medicine okay there are people who do spagyric medicine there are people who do alchemy there are people who do astrology but how do you link precisely spagyric um, working with astrology how does that work together when you do it okay so i only ever make uh, spagyric medicines for uh as a talismanic spagyric okay so i would elect a time uh that's right for any sort of planet uh and make it uh, well i collect all the things all the materials at the right planetary hours of that planet um, I would go into do a ceremonial magic kind of, um, uh, you know, a planetary magic kind of mm -hmm. uh, ritual, mm -hmm. uh, put it all together at the right time and consecrate it at the exact moment. Then um, you are in the Hellenistic world again, right? Yeah, and as yeah. this is probably Arabic as well, the, mm -hmm. the Arabic magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah, and then obviously you can't make a spagyric that quickly. It's, you know, it's an ongoing thing. So then every time I then work with that materia, I would work at, it the, at, work at it at the right planetary hour. So it always corresponds to that planet. So by the time that medicine's finished, it hopefully has so much of that planet's essence in it that I can use. And, and I would have petitioned for the planetary spirits to you know, to do, to, to, to invoke some kind of a, you know, um, condition, you know, mm -hmm. that I've, that I've petitioned for that, mm -hmm. um, medicine. So then I can kind of bottle, bottle that chart up, you know, because it, there's a lot of rules to come to a planetary election, which is mm -hmm. when you choose a time, it's very, very precise and detailed and it takes a long time to come to a right chart. So when you do find that right chart, you want to make the most of it um, sure. and there are some i'm working on a saturn one at the moment because you know the next time saturn's in aquarius which is in its own sign would be another 29 years so mm. some things you know are, are very uh long between opportunities so you've got to uh, take them when you can and are urgent to, to, to do them when the opportunity arises right yeah, uh, yeah. well that was yeah. a 3 30 in the morning ceremony so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you, know? you mean. <laughs> and, and if you may, um, just tell us a bit more in detail about that bee allergy remedy. Well, remedy, you know, uh, how you handle it. Mm. Well, it was getting to the point where I was either going to have to give up the, mm. the bees or, well, yeah, to give up the bees because I was ending up in hospital too much. Mm. And, mm. you know, it is a fallacy. People think that if you get stung a lot, you get a immunity to bees, but no, it's not, not the case. Sure. Sometimes yeah. even the contrary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that was my in my case, yes. So I just thought, you know, there's got to be another way. At that time, I was kind of thinking I might have been a commercial beekeeper. I had about 30 hives at the time. So it was a big kind of loss, like to have to sure. give it all up, a lot of work, a lot of money spent on boxes and things like that. Mm. So I decided to just open, you know, think, oh, well, what, what do bees correspond to? They, they correspond to the sun. Uh, mm -hmm. Honey corresponds to Venus, and they happen to be the two hours that are next to each other in the Chaldean order of the planetary hours. So I thought I'm just going to try it. And I do notice there's so much karma um, on those hours. And, of course, I always suit up these days. Like in the past, I might not have always been that careful, but these days I do. And... Um, That I've always found the like very much calmer on the Saturn, the Sun and the Venus hours, and I can invariably just tell you without looking at a watch or a time when the Mercury hour comes in. Oh, really? Mm. Because I know I can see it in the bees. I can see they start to stress. They, they start getting really agitated. They start getting mm. really busy, and I just get this sense okay they're getting angry i'm going to close the hive and then i'll check my phone and it'll say ah oh, mercury hour 
Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that relates exactly to the phrase that I read about you and that intrigued me when I first saw it. It said, astrology is a way of life, not a livelihood. Um, yes. <laughs> so that, that's part of it. What other parts of your life, if, well, probably you were going to tell me everything, but maybe you can give us a few more examples, are that way of life that are different because you're an astrologer um, mm. to, to people who are not? Mm. Well, for example, being a mother of three boys, mm. um, I, I definitely do... Look, I don't follow their charts like you would imagine I would, like looking at every transit. No, I, I kind of keep an eye on the big cycles because they're very developmental. Mm. Um, and so I track, I do check their charts closely in that regard and not so much in terms of a predictive thing, but in the context of like how can I best support their development mm. and that when they undergo, for example, I've got a son at the moment who is in a Saturn for Daria period mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he and Saturn is a planet that's often associated with like depression or mm. being sad or just just low energy and um, and you know he's just all of a sudden as this planet's kicked in he's just become very uh, uh, you know like he, he used to be very active but now he's, he doesn't even want to leave the house he's very he stays in his room all the time he doesn't want to mm. just non enthusiastic about everything but. Most parents would worry and, you know, to a degree I'm like, oh, he needs to get moving. But part of me knows that, oh, he's just going through Saturn right now. And so that gives me a bit of understanding with how I can best support him. You know, he mm -hmm. needs maybe to have time alone. Maybe I need to take the brothers away from him. He needs um, to be put to some kind of a productive work, you know, in mm -hmm. maybe making something or, you know, Mm -hmm. You know, so so I can I can I guess look at the symbols and see how that applies to the ch child's development. Right. Uh, but apart from that, you know, grow, I grow a lot of my own food, so using the moon cycle for that and planetary hours for that. Sure. As well. Sure. sure. Um, so yeah. it's part of your daily life, so to speak. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, even but even. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry, go, was, go ahead. No, go I ahead. was going to say, even um, I do, when I get time, I do paint and all my paintings generally have a astrological um, meaning behind it. For, for example, I only ever start paintings at an election. If I ah, see okay. a good election for a painting, I'll start mm -hmm. one. I might mm -hmm. not get to finish that painting in a while, but I will consecrate that canvas and start it. And I've had some really amazing results with that. So they've become like talismanic paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I was not going to ask you, but now that you mentioned, because in the background here, of course, people don't see that when I speak to you. I see those canvases with half, with half finished paintings. So I, <laughs> now I got the answer to my question. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's carry it outside your own life. Now, you, of course, you are a consultant. People come to, well, I don't know if they come to see you or if you go to see them or if you do it also via the Internet or other media. Um, uh, how much has astrology as a consultant become part of your life now? Well, I, it's become part of my outer life now, but I was very secretive about it for a long time. I really? Was, yeah. I, I didn't really tell anyone I was an astrologer. Of course, close friends knew I was. Um, but, yeah, I I feel like I've been persecuted in a past life or something. It took a lot mm. for me to be very public about what I do. Mm. Um, and it still scares the bejesus out of me, but I, I've, I've become quite used to sort of like, say, being on podcasts and things like that. But yeah. yeah. And I guess that was also because I was working in a corporate kind of setting in the past mm. and it wasn't mm. really, you know, astrology, of it's, it's very different now to what it was. Like, you know, you tell people you were an astrologer 20 years ago and you were just a crazy person, but now it kind of gets a little bit of respect, you know, just mm -hmm. a tiny little bit. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so much more awareness about what 
what it is now. Um, so it's much easier now to come, have my astrological coming out, but it certainly wasn't um, yeah, that public. It was public. certainly for a long time also influenced by the Catholic Church that you mentioned earlier that, that really, to all things, a little bit magical was very opposed and, and branded it as a as bad thing, right? Yeah, and I think also the pop astrology, like you're not, um, yeah, sure. you know, like the horoscopic sort of astrology, where these days they would actually get astrologers to write them. And in, in the, the previous days, you know, it would be any sort of grad on the editorial team that, you know, would just make stuff up, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. of course, yeah. like it's not going to be. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm not valid. always sure if this pop thing is also written by a, a chat bot nowadays, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, okay, so but you, um, I mean, maybe it's hard to say. I'm not asking for percentages or whatever. But how much of your life does consultation now use? How much? How, how much is it become part of your daily procedure, so to speak? Oh, okay. Well, my every work, I generally have like three working days mm -hmm. uh, because I, I'm also a full time mum. So sure. Um, Yeah, so generally three days a week I'll be in consultations and mm -hmm. I also do teaching as well. Um, and that has to kind of fall in whenever I can. Um, yeah, it's it's always a juggle because I've got the sure. farm and I've got the kids and, you know, I've got the business, but it's just something that I kind of fit in here and wherever I can. It's given me the flexibility as well as opposed to being in a nine-to-five job. So I can say talk to you at say at 10 o'clock at night you know and that's fine yeah um so it's um yeah so generally oh yeah so before i was actually online like three years before covid hit so okay. when covid hit there was no transition and i actually had one of my busiest years so right because people also were yeah. more interested maybe in those things and had time for it also right <laughs> They had time, yeah. yeah. And at the time, people got paid out a lot of money from the government for yeah, not being yeah. able to work. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. It was uh, but but yeah. if I get you right, so you do your consultation basically on the internet, not live with people, but but uh, on the internet, right? Yeah, on the internet, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I do prefer it, actually. Um, yeah, it just it's just more time efficient and I can... You know, I, it's easier for me to like pull back and do my meditation between clients and all this sort of stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. if there's someone in my space, I guess I'm a bit of an empath. I, I find that affects me a lot. And it, it, so, it can maybe also change your vision on the charts in a way. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, mm. I worry about other things. You know, I can't just, I can't be as focused. Yeah. Okay. So, and I really don't think it takes anything away being online for an astrological consultation because I'm not tactile i don't have to touch them or anything yeah so yeah 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 it would be different in the, in the spiritist uh, environment for example but it's i understand well, especially when you talk about the traditional path in astrology i agree it's 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 something that is independent of the location and with whom you are it's 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 mm. a situation and paper in a way right Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. The only thing is like if I, if I, so with these talismans that I make, sometimes I might sort of prescribe them as a remedy for a, mm -hmm. a, a planet that needs it in the chart. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I may have to send that by post, but that's the only, or yeah. I can maybe suggest remedies that they can do themselves by working through the herbal world and, and yeah. through other methods that they can sort of have yeah. their own agency to organize themselves. I see what you mean. Um, now, has uh, the fact that since you've got to write for about five years now that you're doing the, the consultation, right? Um, has that, I don't mean in regards of your timetable, but in regards of the way you see things and see even astrology itself, has that changed your view? Has that or developed or, or, or modified in a way how you see astrology because you have those communicative interferences yeah definitely i mean every client you have it teaches you so much about you know how symbols can manifest mm -hmm. so i feel like i get a lot out of each client session as well um and i yeah definitely it does either help confirm 
things that you already know. And that's always really great to have another confirmation of like, oh, wow, there's another example of this. Or it can show you some unique ways that people creatively manifest those symbols, which you think, oh, I wouldn't have thought that before. But then that stays in the back of your mind for every time you see that symbol again. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so it definitely, I think consultations is a must. It keeps you, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a must, you think, for an astrologer to to do it. I think so. I think it is definitely part of your, a, a very important part of your practice. I think you always have to have your hand in it. Like even though I probably prefer to teach because I do, consultations are draining but and I do prefer to teach but I always have a very sort of at least small baseline of clients. Mm. Um, You know, you have to keep your hand in it. You know, it's the mental agility. It's the... Yeah, like if you haven't read a client's chart for a while, it kind of takes you a while to kind of get into putting those lens on again. That's what I find personally anyway. Right, right, right. Mm. It's like a yoga teacher that doesn't practice yoga on the for themselves. Yeah, yeah, like sure. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. kind of have to, yeah. Not only with yourself, aspect. but you also have to, to, to show other people how to do it and learn from their difficulties and learn from their problems, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and also being able to communicate that mm-hmm. is is mm-hmm. one of the biggest skills of an astrologer. Of course. Communication of course. is the key. Yes, sure. You know, there's a lot of astrologers that are great astrologers, but they have terrible bedside manner. Um, but then... Yeah, it's it's you really don't need that many symbols, but it's more about listening and mm-hmm. and being able to communicate that in a way that really reaches them. Mm-hmm. Would you would you mm. call astrology a divinatory art or is it <laughs> separate from that? <laughs> I do. I do call it a divinatory art, definitely. My shoe today does. But uh, me, say, 20 years, you know, 15 years ago or so when I was doing just mainly modern stuff, I would have said, oh, of course not. You know, we're very psychological (laughs) and, you know, we're more credible than just this woo-woo stuff. Right. But the more and more I do it, the more I see the divinatory process involved Mm -hmm. that that it's the meeting of one soul like the the soul of the astrologer with the client coming at a specific time which is often unplanned not elected um and 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 i do look at the consultation chart too because sometimes it tells me how they're coming into the session and how I can best support them. Like right. Whether they may be a bit nervous or whether they need, like, don't need the details, they just need, you know, like the big picture or, you know, so it, it tells me a little bit about what they might be going through now. So Right, right. Definitely there is a divinatory process. Mm-hmm. And as you, mm. I, I think you said, in my opinion, you said a key word just now: the, uh, to build something. It's 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 not just aha, that's going to happen, but you realize a situation that you can then deal with, right? And that's the that's what mm. divinatory means, and not just um, mm. wait for things to happen that you read in in the chart. Yeah, right. yeah, that's right. You, and we're kind of assessing potential. So it's not that mm. we're locked into any certain situation. It's just that we can see how we can steer it. Have yeah. you Which in is your whole what magicians in, do? <laughs> yes, exactly. Have you in your holistic um, uh, uh, approach to things? Have you ever tried other divinatory arts like the tarot, for example, or even in spiritism, there are divinatory parts in it sometimes yeah well yeah so so i I do do horror astrology which is the divinatory form of astrology but yeah in 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 terms of other forms you know it's so funny i don't know why i've never studied the tarot because you would think i would but i i feel like um and I definitely do. It's on my bucket list. I just feel like I don't have enough room in my brain mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, mm-hmm. anymore. But yes, when I was in the spiritualist sort of that my era of my spiritualism, that was probably the closest to any other form of divinity. Mm-hmm. I am teaching myself the I Ching at the moment, um, <laughs> probably because um, 
yeah, a message from my father said, yes, you need to learn the I Ching and yeah. get back to your roots. See your background, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's one of those funny things. This I'm not sure with, if you look at the chart, the third house, ninth house axis. You know, the ninth house is all about the culture that you were born into, mm -hmm. uh, the practices, the religion, the spirituality. The third house is your own praxis and I feel like my astrology has been very much my own praxis. Um, the, my, the culture that I was born into, that night house stuff, all the Taoist stuff, you know, I remember like eating cakes from the altar and like, you know, going to get a talisman and stuff, but it, it was never really a praxis for me. Mm. Uh, and that's why I feel the Taoist stuff. I have to relearn. Uh, like someone said, I'm a born again Chinese. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like I have to be reborn as a Chinese to, to, you know, and I feel my nodal return was one of the moments that I was born again <laughs> into my culture. Do, do you think you will at some point investigate Chinese astrology? Yeah, I think I will. Um, yeah, probably. I just feel like I don't have the capacity right now. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, it, it's completely different and yeah. um, I just feel I don't have enough brain power um, hmm. to to study it. So there's so much I want to study. I just, yeah. Of you know, course, yeah. The more you, you learn, the sure. less you know. You always have to know everything. That's it. Um, um, <sighs> you mentioned Chaldean astrology. You mentioned Hellenistic, uh, Arabian and Babylonian and Persian, of course. Um, and all of them have a kind of... Uh, slightly different approach to certain things um, and of course those who who talk against astrology would use those differences to say well so you see it's all crap because because nobody mm -hmm. says the same thing um, how do you answer those people i mean i don't think there are many of them around here in this podcast <laughs> but but um, <laughs> they might be confronted with that same question how do you uh, yeah. like, how would you help them in an answer how how can you explain oh. the difference between chaldean and and even renaissance astrology you know? Yeah. Oh, well, firstly, I stay away from those people. And it's the reason why I live. <laughs> I live on 80 acres pretty much and I don't see anyone. Good choice, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's um, option one. If that can't be done and I am face to face with someone, I guess I would just say, look, I take the parts that I like out of each culture um, and it is a cultural study. It's not sure. just the fact that it was astrology was done. You know, it's only in recent times that astrology was completely separated from the culture. But yeah. in all these other historical periods, like yeah. astrology, astrology was like, um, you know, uh, a government decision you know like it, it it was just the thing you know to to listen to so mm. i I, th i think what i the approach i would take is the fact that we live in such a dense environment now a dense world that there is such a non-linear perspective that there's no merging of the inner worlds and the symbolic worlds with the outer reality but if we go to a country like india you know for for a government a politician to actually see an astrologer about a big problem to do with the country and the astrologers may say, okay, well, go to this place on this certain day, repeat mm -hmm. this mantra and then go feed the crows or whatever. They would just go and do that. They, you know, they, they, the, the worldview in that culture is such that there is no divide between the these two worlds. And this is right. a big problem in the Western world, in the modern Western world, that there mm. is such a disintegration, a yeah. decentralization, the individuation gone way too far, that there is just a complete disregard for anything else. And so it, it's my goal to really try and get people to recognize that there is another part of them that is so much alive. <laughs> yeah, that, but it's, that, that's a hard battle. <laughs> that closes again the circle about what we spoke before we started the interview when, and that maybe already has to be my last question for today. Um, we were talking about this holistic approach that you have and, and, and I mentioned hermeticism and you 
uh, said, well, it's something you're coming to now. So that's interesting because somehow I had, from what I hear about you, expected the other way around, but you're actually going from astrology out into all this other stuff. Can you, can you explain a bit about that? <laughs> That was definitely the um, my discovery of traditional astrology that's mm -hmm. the uh, the instigator for all of this, because when I studied traditional astrology, it really opened my eyes to a whole different world, and that world was a world that where it, astrology was so integrated with other parts of the culture, mm -hmm. medicine, education, science, technology, everything, and and that is what really led me to Hermeticism because it was through right. that and we got the understanding of the modelling of the earth being in the centre of the celestial spheres. You know, modern astrology doesn't teach you any of that because it, no. it's not rooted in that philosophy. Exactly. It's rooted in the, yeah, the material centre, the earth being the person, like the individual. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it has a complete disregard for the environment Mm. you know the the animistic world around that person yeah yeah so yeah I, i've gone with a backwards approach to um hermeticism but yeah, i'm glad i found it because yeah. it's made me a better astrologer it's interesting and also i think um, that you mentioned several times in this interview the word animistic in regards to astrology i find that highly interesting because it's also uh, it's it's what I hear from you is much less brainy as it, uh, and and please take that as an as a compliment, right? Uh, um, uh, than what you often hear, and it's not just paper and books and and uh, piles of books that you have to read. It's it's also sensing things and understanding and seeing things and and I think that's the lesson we can take from you um, when we talk about astrology. Yeah, I guess you would sense it through the data that you gathered. So, um, mm -hmm. and that's, I guess, where the more uh, left side of the brain comes in, mm -hmm. you know, in your prep work, you're getting all the data. What are the time lords currently in play? When are these yeah. cycles happening? All this sort of stuff. And what's being activated? What are the rulers? And then you kind of have to turn that side off because none of that makes sense to anyone else right uh, and and you have to really engage the symbolic mind to bring life to that data to bring right. meaning yeah yes right so um, a young person who say listen to this show that well hmm, i finally have to deal with more astrology um but i have <laughs> I don't know where to start with. Um, uh, what would you, somebody who is keen, who has maybe some background already in, in, in the esoteric world in general, but um, not yet in astrology, what would you tell that person? Where should they uh, oh try gosh. to start? <laughs> okay, well, definitely don't do what I did. I've just gone the <laughs> backwards way around. <laughs> You know, I have had such a lack of good mentoring and, mm -hmm. you know, I've really fumbled my way through it, through it all, which in a way was good in a way because I really learnt the hard way, the slow way, mm -hmm. the hard way, very Saturnian. Um, but I guess my uh, favourite kind of schools are, I'm a big fan of the School of Traditional Astrology in London, mm -hmm. uh, Deb Holdings school there I did some training there and right um yeah really yeah real they, they, they're the, the real deal you know mm -hmm. um um so that's in, that's a good school I would highly recommend school mm -hmm. of traditional astrology um other than that I think it, you know it's good to maybe get a, a consultation from a, an astrologer that you think you might like this style of, just to actually maybe start from the reverse, see see what see what the outcome is, so mm -hmm. that you can then understand how to work backwards. So you, out of a reading, you might have liked something in particular, uh, and, and it might also illuminate to you some of the foundational stuff as well. So you then are kind of 
shows you what sort of foundational knowledge you might need to know and what particular styles that you might like to take. So you may want to actually see a few different types of astrologers to get their different styles. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think I'm that um, common. Like, you know, there's not a, a lot of astrologers out there that are, yeah. I guess, into what I'm like yeah. my style, but that kind of makes it my own style. Right. And every, yeah. if you yeah. study astrology, you you too will come to yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And style. That, that's exactly what interested me. And that's why you were here today, because you are a bit different from the big lot. And that was highly interesting. And as you said, starting with a new art like astrology, it's like with all esoteric and occult arts, the first thing is know yourself, right? Uh, yes, and, that's yeah. right. <laughs> right. Well, Shu, thank yeah. you so much for, for that hour, a bit over an hour in your company. And uh, thanks for your time. It's now after months, just about midnight, I believe, in Australia, in your, <laughs> in your area. Thank you for staying up late with us and uh, for telling us all those interesting things. Um, and good luck with all that's coming up and um, be careful with the bees. Yes, thank you. I've really enjoyed this chat, Rudolph, and keep up the great work. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.
Vitruvian Man 777, a third track by Pete on the Beat, our musical guest here today, our musical guest and fervent listener of the Thos Hermes podcast. Thanks, Pete, once again for your lovely tracks and uh, all of you go to the website for the show notes and get the links to see more of his work. Right, and to, I would also extend my thanks to Shu Yap, who did a lovely talk for us. Um, and uh, I think if you have any requests from her, she will be very happy to answer them. Go on their website, Inter Intercycle. I hope I pronounced that properly. In any case, if not, also that, of course, you'll find it on the website of the Thoughts Hermes podcast. Go visit her, it's worth it, and she might also be good to give you a reading or so. Right. Okay. Well, I thanked Pete, I thanked you, and now I'm thanking you, you the audience, because without you, this podcast would maybe exist, but no, makes no sense whatsoever. So thank you for being with us here today and all through the other four and a half years. Yes, four and a half years already. And uh, so uh, really lovely, lovely to have you around. So what's up next week? Next week we are coming back on, of course, November 14, Sunday again. And my guest next week will be a returning guest again. Somebody, I think many of you have uh, been waiting for him to return, David Beth. David Beth, who this time is, will be talking about that special book that his Theon Publishing House released lately and which had created a big stir because people thought he was the author. In fact, it was an author who goes by a pseudonym. And yeah, well, we talk about all that, but it's mostly about Saturn and the influence of Saturn on our world, not so much only in an astrological, but rather in a magical point of view. So next week, uh, we uh, hope to have you back together when we have here our Saturnian reflections. That's how the episode is called, with the great David Beth. Well, that's all for today, guys. Thank you once again for being here. Come back next week and consider becoming a patron, right? Okay. So for today, what do I say? Take care. Stay tuned. Hear you soon.